Reading by Greg Marguerite The Horla by Guy de Maupassant May 8th. What a lovely day! I have spent all the morning lying in the grass in front of my house, under the enormous plantain tree which covers it and shades and shelters the whole of it. I like this part of the country, and I am fond of living here because I am attached to it by deep roots, profound and delicate roots which attach a man to the soil on which his ancestors were born and died, which attach him to what people think and what they eat, to the usages as well as to the food, local expression, the peculiar language of the peasants, to the smell of the soil, of the villages, and of the atmosphere itself. I love my house in which I grew up. From my windows I can see the Seine which flows by the side of my garden. On the other side of the road, almost through my grounds, the great and wide Seine which goes to Rouen and Havre, and which is covered with boats passing to and fro. On the left, down yonder, lies Rouen, that large town with its blue roofs under its pointed Gothic towers. They are innumerable, delicate or broad, dominated by the spire of the cathedral and full of bells, which sound through the blue air on fine mornings, sending their sweet and distant iron clang to me, their metallic sound which the breeze wafts in my direction, now stronger and now weaker, according as the wind is strong or lighter. What a delicious morning it was! About eleven o'clock a long line of boats drawn by a steam-tug as big as a fly, and which scarcely puffed while emitting its thick smoke, passed my gate. After two English schooners whose red flag fluttered towards the sky, there came a magnificent Brazilian three-master. It was perfectly white and wonderfully clean and shining. I saluted it. I hardly know why, except that the sight of the vessel gave me great pleasure. May 12th. I have had a slight feverish attack for the last few days, and I feel ill, or rather I feel low-spirited. Whence do these mysterious influences come, which change our happiness into discouragement and our self-confidence into diffidence? One might almost say that the air, the invisible air, is full of unknowable forces, whose mysterious presence we have to endure. I wake up in the best spirits, with an inclination to sing in my throat. Why? I go down by the side of the water, and suddenly, after walking a short distance, I return home wretched, as if some misfortune were awaiting me there. Why? Is it a cold shiver which, passing over my skin, has upset my nerves and given me low spirits? Is it the form of the clouds, or the color of the sky, or the color of the surrounding objects, which is so changeable, which have troubled my thoughts as they passed before my eyes? Who can tell? Everything that surrounds us, everything that we see without looking at, everything that we touch without knowing it, everything that we handle without feeling it, all that we meet without clearly distinguishing it, has a rapid, surprising, and inexplicable effect upon us and our organs, and through them on our ideas and on our heart itself. How profound that mystery of the invisible is! We cannot fathom it with our miserable senses, with our eyes which are unable to perceive what is either too small or too great, too near to or too far from us, neither the inhabitants of a star nor of a drop of water, with our ears that deceive us, for they transmit to us the vibrations of the air in sonorous notes. They are fairies who work the miracle of changing that movement into noise, and by that metamorphosis give birth to music, which makes the mute agitation of nature musical with our sense of smell which is smaller than that of a dog, with our sense of taste which can scarcely distinguish the age of a wine. Oh, if we only had other organs which would work other miracles in our favor, what a number of fresh things we might discover around us! May 16th. I am ill, decidedly. I was so well last month. I am feverish, horribly feverish, or rather I am in a state of feverish enervation which makes my mind suffer as much as my body. I have without ceasing that horrible sensation of some danger threatening me, that apprehension of some coming misfortune or of approaching death, that presentiment which is no doubt an attack of some illness which is still unknown, which germinates in the flesh and in the blood. May 18th I have just come from consulting my medical man, for I could no longer get any sleep. He found that my pulse was high, my eyes dilated, my nerves highly strung, but no alarming symptoms. I must have a course of shower-baths and of bromide of potassium. May 25th. No 
change. My state is really very peculiar. As the evening comes on, an incomprehensible feeling of disquietude seizes me, just as if night concealed some terrible menace toward me. I, I dine quickly and then try to read, but I do not understand the words and can scarcely distinguish the letters. Then I walk up and down my drawing-room, uh, oppressed by a feeling of confused and irresistible fear, the fear of sleep and fear of my bed. About ten o'clock I go up to my room. As soon as I have got in, I double lock and bolt it. I am frightened. Of what? Up till the present time I have been frightened of nothing. I open my cupboards and look under my bed. I listen. I listen. To what? How strange it is that a simple feeling of discomfort impede or heighten circulation, perhaps the irritation of a nervous thread, a slight congestion, a small disturbance in the imperfect and delicate functions of our living machinery, can turn the most light-hearted of men into a melancholy one, and make a coward of the bravest. Then I go to bed, and I wait for sleep as a man might wait for the executioner. I wait for its coming with dread, and my heart beats and my legs tremble while my whole body shivers beneath the warmth of the bedclothes, until the moment when I suddenly fall asleep, as one would throw oneself into a pool of stagnant water in order to drown oneself. I do not feel it coming over me as I used to do formerly. This perfidious sleep which is close to me and watching me, which is going to seize me by the head, to close my eyes and annihilate me. I sleep. A long time. Two or three hours, perhaps. Then a dream. No. A nightmare lays hold of me. I feel that I am in bed and asleep. I feel it and I know it. And I feel also that somebody is coming close to me, is looking at me, touching me, is getting on to my bed, is kneeling on my chest, is taking my neck between his hands and squeezing it, squeezing it with all his might in order to strangle me. I struggle, bound by that terrible powerlessness which paralyzes us in our dreams. I try to cry out, but I cannot. I want to move. I cannot. I try, with the most violent effort and out of breath, to turn over and throw off this being which is crushing and suffocating me. I cannot. And then, suddenly, I wake up, shaken and bathed in perspiration. I light a candle and find that I am alone, and after that crisis which occurs every night, I at length fall asleep and slumber tranquilly till morning. June 2nd. My state has grown worse. What is the matter with me? The bromide does me no good, and the shower-baths have no effect whatever. Sometimes in order to tire myself out, though I am fatigued enough already, I go for a walk in the forest of Rue Marie. I used to think at first that the fresh light and soft air, impregnated with the odor of herbs and leaves, would instill new blood into my veins and impart fresh energy to my heart. I turned into a broad ride in the wood, and then I turned toward La Bouya through a narrow path between two rows of exceedingly tall trees which placed a thick, green, almost black roof between the sky and me. A sudden shiver ran through me, not a cold shiver, but a shiver of agony, and so I hastened my steps, uneasy at being alone in the wood, frightened stupidly and without reason, at the profound solitude. Suddenly it seemed to me as if I were being followed, that somebody was walking at my heels, close, quite close to me near enough to touch me. I turned round suddenly, but I was alone. I saw nothing behind me except the straight, broad ride, empty and bordered by high trees, horribly empty. On the other side it also extended until it was lost in the distance and looked just the same. Terrible. I closed my eyes. Why? And then I began to turn round on one heel very quickly, just like a top. I nearly fell down and opened my eyes. The trees were dancing round me and the earth heaved. I was obliged to sit down. Then, ah, I no longer remembered how I had come. What a strange idea! What a strange, strange idea! I did not the least know. I started off to the right and got back into the avenue which had led me into the middle of the forest. June 3rd. I have had a terrible night. I shall go away for a few weeks, for no doubt a journey will set me up again. July 2nd. I have come back quite cured, and have had a most delightful trip into the bargain. I have been to Mont Saint-Michel, which I had not seen before. What a sight, when one arrives as I did at Alvranche toward the end of the day. The town stands on a hill, and I was taken into the public garden at the extremity of the town. 
I uttered a cry of astonishment. An extraordinary large bay lay extended before me as far as my eyes could reach between two hills which were lost to sight in the mist, and in the middle of this immense yellow bay, under a clear golden sky, a peculiar hill rose up, somber and pointed in the midst of the sand. The sun had just disappeared, and under the still flaming sky the outline of that fantastic rock stood out, which bears on its summit a fantastic monument. At daybreak I went to it. The tide was low, as it had been the night before, and I saw that wonderful abbey rise up before me as I approached it. After several hours' walking I reached the enormous mass of rocks which supports the little town, dominated by the great church. Having climbed the steep and narrow street I entered the most wonderful Gothic building that has ever been built to God on earth, as large as a town full of low rooms which seemed buried beneath vaulted roofs and lofty galleries supported by delicate columns. I entered this gigantic granite jewel, which is as light as a bit of lace, covered with towers, with slender belfries to which spiral staircases ascend, and which raise their strange heads that bristle with chimera, with devils, with fantastic animals, with monstrous flowers, and which are joined together by finely carved arches to the blue sky by day, and to the black sky by night. When I had reached the summit I said to the monk who accompanied me, father, how happy you must be here!" And he replied, It is very windy, monsieur. And so we began to talk while watching the rising tide, which ran over the sand and covered it with a steel caress. And then the monk told me stories, all the old stories belonging to the place, legends, nothing but legends. One of them struck me forcibly. The country people, those belonging to the Mornay, declared that at night one can hear talking going on in the sand and then that one hears two goats bleat, one with a strong, the other with a weak voice. Incredulous people declare that it is nothing but the cry of the sea-birds which occasionally resembles bleatings and occasionally human lamentations. But belated fishermen swear that they have met an old shepherd whose head, which is covered by his cloak, they can never see, wandering on the downs between two tides round the little town placed so far out of the world and who is guiding and walking before them a he-goat with a man's face, and a she-goat with a woman's face, and both of them with white hair, and talking incessantly, quarreling in a strange language, and then suddenly ceasing to talk in order to bleat with all their might. Do you believe it? I asked the monk. I scarcely know, he replied, and I continued, if there are other beings besides ourselves on this earth, how come it is that we have not known it for so long a time? Or why have you not seen them? How is it that I have not seen them? He replied, Do we see the hundred thousandth part of what exists? Look here. There is the wind, which is the strongest force in nature, which knocks down men and blows down buildings, uproots trees, raises the sea into mountains of water, destroys cliffs and casts great ships into the breakers. The wind which kills, which whistles, which sighs, which roars. Have you ever seen it? And can you see it? It exists for all that, however." I was silent before this simple reasoning. The man was a philosopher, or perhaps a fool, I could not say which exactly, so I held my tongue. What he had said had often been in my own thoughts. July 3rd. I have slept badly. Certainly there is some feverish influence here, for my coachman is suffering in the same way as I am. When I went back home yesterday I noticed his singular paleness, and I asked him, What is the matter with you, Jean? The matter is that I never get any rest, and my nights devour my days. Since your departure, monsieur, there has been a spell over me. However, the other servants are well, but I am very frightened of having another attack myself. July 4th. I am decidedly taken again, for my old nightmares have returned. Last night I felt somebody leaning on me who was sucking my life from between my lips with his mouth. Yes, he was sucking it out of my neck like a leech would have done. Then he got up satiated, and I woke up, so beaten, crushed, and annihilated that I could not move. If this continues for a few days I shall certainly go away again. July 5th. Have I lost my reason? What has happened? What I saw last night is so strange that my head wanders when I think of it. 
as i do now every evening i had locked my door and then being thirsty i drank half a glass of water and i accidentally noticed that the water bottle was full up to the cut glass stopper then i went to bed and fell into one of my terrible sleeps from which i was aroused in about two hours by a still more terrible shock picture to yourself a sleeping man who is being murdered and who wakes up with a knife in his chest and who is rattling in his throat covered with blood and who can no longer breathe and is going to die and does not understand anything at all about it there it is having recovered my senses i was thirsty again so i lit a candle and went to the table on which my water bottle was i lifted it up and tilted it over my glass but nothing came out it was empty it was completely empty at first i could not understand it at all and then suddenly i was seized by such a terrible feeling that i had to sit down or rather i fell into a chair then i sprang up with a bound to look about me and then i sat down again overcome by astonishment and fear in front of the transparent crystal bottle I looked at it with fixed eyes, trying to conjecture, and my hands trembled. Somebody had drunk the water. But who? I? I, without any doubt. It could surely only be I. In that case I was a somnambulist. I lived without knowing it, that double mysterious life which makes us doubt whether there are not two beings in us, or whether a strange, unknowable, and invisible being does not at such moments when our soul is in a state of torpor animate our captive body which obeys this other being as it does ourselves and more than it does ourselves oh who will understand my horrible agony who will understand the emotion of a man who is sound in mind wide awake full of sound sense and who looks in horror at the remains of a little water that has disappeared while he was asleep through the glass of a water bottle and i remained there until it was daylight without venturing to go to bed again july sixth I am going mad. Again, all the contents of my water bottle have been drunk during the night, or rather, I have drunk it. But is it I? Is it I? Who could it be? Who? Oh, God, I, I am going mad. Who will save me? July 10th. I have just been through some surprising ordeals. Decidedly, I am mad. And yet, on July 6th, before going to bed, I put some wine, milk, water, bread, and strawberries on my table. Somebody drank, I drank, all the water and a little of the milk, but neither the wine, bread, nor the strawberries were touched. On the 7th of July, I renewed the same experiment with the same results. And on July 8th, I left out the water and the milk, and nothing was touched. Lastly, on July 9th, I put only water and milk on my table, taking care to wrap up the bottles in white muslin and to tie down the stoppers. Then I rubbed my lips, my beard, and my hands with pencil lead and went to bed. Irresistible sleep seized me, which was soon followed by a terrible awakening. I had not moved, and my sheets were not marked. I rushed to the table. The muslin round the bottles remained intact. I undid the string, trembling with fear. All the water had been drunk and so had the milk. Ah! Uh, great God! I must start for Paris immediately. July 12th, Paris. I must have lost my head during the last few days. I, I must be the plaything of my enervated imagination, unless I am really a somnambulist, or that I have been brought under the power of one of those influences which have been proved to exist, but which have hitherto been inexplicable, which are called suggestions. In any case, my mental state bordered on madness and twenty-four hours of Paris sufficed to restore me to my equilibrium. Yesterday, after doing some business and paying some visits which instilled fresh and invigorating mental air into me, I wound up my evening at the Théâtre Français. A play by Alexandre Dumas, the younger, was being acted, and his active and powerful mind completed my cure. Certainly solitude is dangerous for active minds. We require men who can think and can talk around us. When we are alone for a long time, we people space with phantoms. I returned along the boulevards to my hotel in excellent spirits. Amid the jostling of the crowd, I thought not without irony of my terrors and surmises of the previous week, because I believed, yes, I believed that an invisible being lived beneath my roof. How weak our head is, and how quickly it is terrified and goes astray as soon as we are struck by a small, incomprehensible fact. Instead of concluding with these simple words, I do not understand because the cause escapes me, 
we immediately imagine terrible mysteries and supernatural powers. July 14th. Fate of the Republic. I walked through the streets, and the crackers and flags amused me like a child. Still, it is very foolish to be merry on a fixed date by a government decree. The populace is an imbecile flock of sheep, now steadily patient, and now in ferocious revolt. Say to it, amuse yourself, and it amuses itself. Say to it, go and fight with your neighbor, and it goes and fights. Say to it, vote for the emperor, and it votes for the emperor. And then say to it, vote for the republic, and it votes for the republic. Those who direct it are also stupid, but instead of obeying men they obey principles, which can only be stupid, sterile, and false for the very reason that they are principles, that is to say, ideas which are considered as certain and unchangeable in this world where one is certain of nothing, since light is an illusion and noise is an illusion. July 16th. I saw some things yesterday that troubled me very much. I was dining at my cousin Madame Sabal, whose husband is colonel of the seventy-sixth chasseur at Limoges. There were two young women there, one of whom had married a medical man, Dr. Parent, who devotes himself a great deal to nervous diseases and the extraordinary manifestations to which at this moment experiments in hypnotism and suggestion give rise. He related to us at some length the enormous results obtained by English scientists and the doctors of the medical school at Nancy and the facts which he adduced appeared to me so strange that I declared that I was altogether incredulous. We are, he declared, on the point of discovering one of the most important secrets of nature. I mean to say, one of its most important secrets on this earth, for there are certainly some which are a different kind of importance up in the stars yonder. Ever since man has thought, since he has been able to express and write down his thoughts, he has felt himself close to a mystery which is impenetrable to his coarse and imperfect senses, and he endeavors to supplement the want of power of his organs by the efforts of his intellect. As long as that intellect still remained in its elementary stage, this intercourse with invisible spirits assumed forms which were commonplace, though terrifying. Thence sprang the popular belief in the supernatural, the legends of wandering spirits, of fairies, of gnomes, ghosts. I might even say the legend of God, for our conceptions of the workman creator, from whatever religion they may have come down to us, are certainly the most mediocre, the stupidest, and the most unacceptable inventions that ever sprang from the frightened brain of any human creatures. Nothing is truer than what Voltaire says. God made man in his own image, but man has certainly paid him back again. But for rather more than a century men seem to have had a presentiment of something new. Mesmer and some others have put us on an unexpected track, and especially within the last two or three years we have arrived at really surprising results. My cousin, who is also very incredulous, smiled, and Dr. Parent said to her, Would you like me to try and send you to sleep, madame? Yes. Certainly. She sat down in an easy chair, and he began to look at her fixedly, so as to fascinate her. I suddenly felt myself somewhat uncomfortable, with a beating heart and a choking feeling in my throat. I saw that Madame Sabal's eyes were growing heavy, her mouth twitched, and her bosom heaved, and at the end of ten minutes she was asleep. Stand behind her, the doctor said to me, and so I took a seat behind her. He put a visiting card into her hands, and said to her, This is a looking-glass. What do you see in it? And she replied, I see my cousin. What is he doing? He is twisting his moustache? And now he's taking a photograph out of his pocket. Whose photograph is it? His own? That was true, and that photograph had been given me that same evening at the hotel. What is his attitude in the portrait? He is standing up with his hat in his hand. So she saw on that card, on that piece of white pasteboard, as if she had been looking at it in a looking-glass. The young women were frightened, and exclaimed, That is quite enough, quite, quite enough. But the doctor said to her authoritatively, You will get up at eight o'clock tomorrow morning, and then you will go and call on your cousin at his hotel and ask him to lend you five thousand francs, which your husband demands of you, and which he will ask for when he sets out on his coming journey. Then he woke her up. On returning to my hotel I thought over this curious séance, and I was assailed by doubts, not as to my cousin's absolute and undoubted good faith, for I had known her as well as if she had been my own sister ever since she was a child. 
but as to a possible trick on the doctor's part. Had not he, perhaps, kept a glass hidden in his hand which he showed to the young woman in her sleep at the same time as he did the card? Professional conjurers do things which are just as singular. So I went home and to bed, and this morning at about half-past eight I was awakened by my footman, who said to me, Madame Sabal has asked to see you immediately, monsieur, so I dressed hastily and went to her. She sat down in some agitation, with her eyes on the floor, and without raising her veil she said to me, My dear cousin, I am going to ask a great favor of you. What is it, cousin? I do not like to tell you, and yet I must. I am in absolute want of five thousand francs. What, you? Yes, I, or rather my husband, who has asked me to procure them for him. I was so stupefied that I stammered out my answers. I asked myself whether she had not really been making fun of me with Dr. Parent, if it were not merely a very well-acted farce which had been got up beforehand. On looking at her attentively, however, my doubts disappeared. She was trembling with grief, so painful was this step to her, and I was sure that her throat was full of sobs. I knew that she was very rich, and so I continued, What? Has not your husband five thousand francs at his disposal? Come, think. Are you sure that he commissioned you to ask me for them?" She hesitated for a few seconds, as if she were making a great effort to search her memory, and then she replied, "'Yes, yes, I am quite sure of it. He has written to you?' She hesitated again and reflected, and I guessed the torture of her thoughts. She did not know. She only knew that she was to borrow five thousand francs of me for her husband. So she told a lie. "'Yes, he has written me. When, pray, you did not mention it to me yesterday. I received his letter this morning. Can you show it to me? No, no. Uh, it contained private matters, things too personal to ourselves. I burnt it. So your husband runs into debt. She hesitated again and then murmured, I, I do not know. Thereupon I said bluntly, I have not five thousand francs at my disposal at this moment, dear cousin. She uttered a kind of cry, as if she were in pain, and said, Oh, oh, I beseech you, I beseech you to get them for me. She got excited and clasped her hands as if she were praying to me. I heard her voice change its tone. She wept and stammered, harassed and dominated by the irresistible order that she had received. Oh, oh, I beg you to, if you knew what I am suffering, I, I want them today. I had pity on her. You shall have them by and by, I swear to you. Oh. Thank you, thank you, how kind you are!" I continued. Do you remember what took place at your house last night? Yes. Do you remember that Dr. Parent sent you to sleep? Yes. Oh, very well then. He ordered you to come to me this morning to borrow five thousand francs, and at this moment you are obeying that suggestion. She considered for a few moments and then replied, But as it is my husband who wants them, for a whole hour I tried to convince her, but could not succeed, and when she had gone I went to the doctor. He was just going out, and he listened to me with a smile, and said, Do you believe now? Yes, I cannot help it. Let us go to your cousin's. She was already dozing on a couch, overcome with fatigue. The doctor felt her pulse, looked at her for some time with one hand raised toward her eyes, which she closed by degrees under the irresistible power of this influence and when she was asleep, he said, Your husband does not require the five thousand francs any longer. You must, therefore, forget that you asked your cousin to lend them to you, and if he speaks to you about it, you will not understand him. Then he woke her up, and I took out a pocket-book and said, Here is what you asked me for this morning, my dear cousin. But she was so surprised that I did not venture to persist. Nevertheless, I tried to recall the circumstance to her, but she denied it vigorously, thought that I was making fun of her, and in the end very nearly lost her temper. There, I have just come back, and I have not been able to eat any lunch, for this experiment has altogether upset me. July 19th. Many people to whom I have told the adventure have laughed at me. I no longer know what to think. The wise man says, perhaps. July 21st. I dined at Bougival, and then I spent the evening at a boatman's ball. Decidedly everything depends on place and surroundings. It would be the height of folly to believe in the supernatural on the Ile de la Grenouillère, but on 
top of Mont Saint Michel? And in India? We are terribly under the influence of our surroundings. I shall return home next week. July 30th. I came back to my house yesterday. Everything is going on well. August 2nd. Nothing fresh. It is splendid weather, and I spend my days in watching the Seine flow past. August 4th. Quarrels among my servants. They declare that the glasses are broken in the cupboards at night. The footman accuses the cook, who accuses the needlewoman, who accuses the other two. Who is the culprit? A clever person to be able to tell. August 6th. This time I am not mad. I have seen, I have seen, I have seen. I can doubt no longer. I have seen it. I was walking at two o'clock among my rose-trees in the full sunlight, in the walk bordered by autumn roses which are beginning to fall. As I stopped to look at a Jean de Bataille, which had three splendid blooms, I distinctly saw the stalk of one of the roses bend, close to me, as if an invisible hand had bent it, and then break, as if that hand had picked it. Then the flower raised itself, following the curve which a hand would have described in carrying it toward a mouth, and it remained suspended in the transparent air all alone and motionless, a terrible red spot three yards from my eyes. In desperation I rushed it to take it. I found nothing. It had disappeared. Then I was seized with furious rage against myself, for it is not allowable for a reasonable and serious man to have such hallucinations. But was it a hallucination? I turned round to look for the stalk, and I found it immediately under the bush, freshly broken, between two other roses which remained on the branch and I returned home then with a much disturbed mind, for I am certain now, as certain as I am of the alteration of day and night, that there exists close to me an invisible being that lives on milk and on water, which can touch objects, take them and change their places, which is consequently endowed with a material nature, although it is impossible to our senses, and which lives, as I do, under my roof. August 7th. I slept tranquilly. He drank the water out of my decanter, but did not disturb my sleep. I ask myself whether I am mad. As I was walking just now in the sun by the riverside, doubts as to my own sanity arose in me, not vague doubts such as I have had hitherto, but precise and absolute doubts. I have seen mad people, and I have known some who have been quite intelligent, lucid, even clear-sighted in every concern of life except on one point. They spoke clearly, readily, profoundly, on everything, when suddenly their thoughts struck upon the breakers of their madness and broke to pieces there, and were dispersed and foundered in that furious and terrible sea full of bounding waves, fogs, and squalls, which is called madness. I certainly should think that I was mad, absolutely mad, if I were not conscious, did not perfectly know my state, if I did fathom it by analyzing it with the most complete lucidity. I should, in fact, be a reasonable man who was laboring under a hallucination. Some unknown disturbance must have been excited in my brain, one of those disturbances which physiologists of the present day try to note and to fix precisely, and that disturbance must have caused a profound gulf in my mind and in the order and logic of my ideas. Similar phenomena occur in the dreams which lead us through the most unlikely phantasmagoria without causing us any surprise because our verifying apparatus and our sense of control has gone to sleep, while our imaginative faculty wakes and works. Is it not possible that one of the imperceptible keys of the cerebral fingerboard has been paralyzed in me? Some men lose the recollection of proper names, or of verbs, or of numbers, or merely of dates in consequence of an accident. The localization of all the particles of thought has been proved nowadays. What then would there be surprising in the fact that my faculty of controlling the unreality of certain hallucinations should be destroyed for the time being? I thought of all this as I walked by the side of the water. The sun was shining brightly on the river and made earth delightful while it filled my looks with love for life, for the swallows whose agility is always delightful in my eyes, for the plants by the riverside whose rustling is a pleasure to my ears. By degrees, however, an inexplicable feeling of discomfort seized me. It seemed to me as if some unknown force were numbing and stopping me, were preventing me from going farther, and were calling me back. I felt that painful wish to return which oppresses you when you have left a beloved invalid at home and when you are seized by a presentiment that he is worse. I therefore returned in spite of myself, feeling certain that I should find some bad news awaiting me, a letter or a telegram. 
There was nothing, however, and I was more surprised and uneasy than if I had had another fantastic vision. August 8th. I spent a terrible evening yesterday. He does not show himself any more, but I feel that he is near me, watching me, looking at me, penetrating me, dominating me, and more redoubtable when he hides himself thus than if he were to manifest his constant and invisible presence by supernatural phenomenon. However, I slept. August 9th. Nothing. But I am afraid. August 10th. Nothing. What will happen tomorrow? August 11th. Still nothing. I cannot stop at home with this fear hanging over me and these thoughts in my mind. I shall go away. August 12th. Ten o'clock at night. All day long I have been trying to get away and have not been able. I wish to accomplish this simple and easy act of liberty. Go out, get in my carriage, in order to go to Rouen. And I have not been able to do it. What is the reason? August 13th. When one is attacked by certain maladies, all the springs of our physical being appear to be broken, all our energies destroyed, all our muscles relaxed, our bones to have become as soft as our flesh, and our blood as liquid as water. I am experiencing that in my moral being in a strange and distressing manner. I have no longer any strength, any courage, any self-control, nor even any power to set my own will in motion. I have no power left to will anything, but someone does it for me, and I obey. August 14th. I am lost. Somebody possesses my soul and governs it. Somebody orders all my acts, all my movements, all my thoughts. I am no longer anything in myself, nothing except an enslaved and terrified spectator of all the things which I do. I wish to go out. I cannot. He does not wish to. And so I remain trembling and distracted in the armchair in which he keeps me sitting. I merely wish to get up and to rouse myself so as to think that I am still master of myself. I cannot. I am riveted to my chair, and my chair adheres to the ground in such a manner that no force could move us. Then, suddenly, I must, I must go to the bottom of my garden and pick some strawberries and eat them. And I go there. I, I pick the strawberries and I eat them. Oh, my God, my God, I, I, is there a God? If there be one, deliver me, save me, succor me, pardon, pity, mercy, save me. Oh, what sufferings, what torture, what horror! August 15th. Certainly, this is the way in which my poor cousin was possessed and swayed when she came to borrow five thousand francs of me. She was under the power of a strange will which had entered into her, like another soul, like another parasitic and ruling soul. Is the world coming to an end? But who is he, this invisible being that rules me, this unknowable being, this rover of a supernatural race? Invisible beings exist, then. How is it, then, that since the beginning of the world they have never manifested themselves in such a manner precisely as they do to me? I have never read anything which resembles what goes on in my house. Oh, if I could only leave it, if I could only go away and flee so as to never return, I should be saved. But I cannot. August 16th. I managed to escape today for two hours, like a prisoner who finds the door of his dungeon accidentally open. I suddenly felt that I was free and that I was far away, and so I gave orders to put the horses in as quickly as possible. And I drove to Rouen. Oh, how delightful to be able to say to a man who obeyed you, Go to Rouen! I made him pull up before the library, and I begged them to lend me Dr. Hermann Herstrasse's treatise on the unknown inhabitants of the ancient and modern world. Then, as I was getting into my carriage, I intended to say, To the railway station! But instead of this, I shouted. I did not say. But I shouted, in such a loud voice that all the passers-by turned round, HOME! And I fell back into the cushion of my carriage, overcome by mental agony. He had found me out and regained possession of me. August 17th. Oh, what a night, what a night! And yet it seems to me that I ought to rejoice. I read until one o'clock in the morning. Herr Stasis, doctor of philosophy and theogony, wrote the history and the manifestation of all those invisible beings which hover around man, or of whom he dreams. He describes their origin, their domains, their power, but none of them resembles the one which haunts me. One might say that man, ever since he has thought, has had a foreboding of and feared a new being stronger than himself, his successor in this world and that, feeling him near and not being able to foretell the nature of that master, he has, in his terror, created the whole race of hidden beings, of vague phantoms born of fear. 
Having therefore read until one o'clock in the morning, I went and sat down at the open window, in order to cool my forehead and my thoughts in the calm night air. It was very pleasant and warm. How I should have enjoyed such a night formerly! There was no moon, but the stars darted out their rays in the dark heavens. Who inhabits those worlds? What forms, what living beings, what animals are there yonder? What do those who are thinkers in those distant worlds know more than we do? What can they do more than we can? What do they see which we do not know? Will not one of them some day or other traversing space appear on our earth to conquer it, just as the Norsemen formerly crossed the sea in order to subjugate nations more feeble than themselves? We are so weak, so unarmed, so ignorant, so small, we who live on this particle of mud which turns round in a drop of water. I fell asleep, dreaming thus in the cool night air, and then, having slept for about three-quarters of an hour, I opened my eyes without moving, awakened by I know not what confused and strange sensation. At first I saw nothing, and then suddenly it appeared to me as if a page of a book which had remained open on my table turned over of its own accord. Not a breath of air had come in at my window, and I was surprised and waited. In about four minutes I saw, I saw, yes, I saw it with my own eyes, another page lift itself up and fall down on the others, as if a finger had turned it over. My armchair was empty, appeared empty, but I knew that he was there. He was sitting in my place, and that he was reading. With a furious bound, the bound of an enraged wild beast that wishes to disembowel its tamer, I crossed my room to seize him, to strangle him, to kill him. But before I could reach it my chair fell over as if somebody had run away from me. My table rocked, my lamp fell and went out, and my window closed as if some thief had been surprised and had fled out into the night, shutting it behind him. So he had run away. He had been afraid. He! Afraid of me! So! So, to-morrow, or later, some day or other, I should be able to hold him in my clutches and crush him against the ground. Do not dogs occasionally bite and strangle their masters? August 18th. I have been thinking the whole day long. Oh, yes, I will obey him, follow his impulses, fulfill all his wishes, show myself humble, submissive, a coward. He is the stronger, but an hour will come. August 19th. I know, I know, I, I know it all. I have just read the following in the Revue de Mont Scientifique. A curious piece of news comes to us from Rio de Janeiro. Madness, an epidemic of madness which may be compared to that contagious madness which attacked the peoples of Europe in the Middle Ages, is at this moment raging in the province of São Paulo. The frightened inhabitants are leaving their houses, deserting their villages, abandoning their land saying that they are pursued, possessed, governed like human cattle by invisible though tangible beings, a species of vampire which feed on their life while they are asleep, and who, besides, drink water and milk without appearing to touch any other nourishment. Professor Dom Pedro Enrique, accompanied by several medical savants, has gone to the province of São Paulo in order to study the origin and the manifestations of this surprising madness on the spot, and to propose such measures to the Emperor as may appear to him to be most fitted to restore the mad population to reason. Ah, ah, I remember now that fine Brazilian three-master which passed in front of my windows as it was going up the Seine on the 8th of last May. I thought it looked so pretty, so white and bright. That being was on board of her, coming from there, where its race sprang from and it saw me, it saw my house, which was also white, and it sprang from the ship onto the land. Oh, good heavens! Now I know, I can divine, the reign of man is over, and he has come, he whom disquieted priests exorcised, whom sorcerers evoked on dark nights without yet seeing him appear, to whom the presentiments of the transient masters of the world lent all the monstrous or graceful forms of gnomes, spirits, genie, fairies, and familiar spirits. After the coarse conceptions of primitive fear, more clear-sighted men foresaw it more clearly. Mesmer divined him, and ten years ago physicians accurately discovered the nature of his power even before he exercised it himself. They played with that weapon of their new lord, the sway of a mysterious will over the human soul which had become enslaved. They called it magnetism, hypnotism, suggestion. What do I know? I have seen them amusing themselves like impudent children with this horrible power. Woe to us! Woe to man! He has come, the—the—what? The, 
what does he call himself? The... I fancy that he is shouting out his name to me, and I do not hear him. The... Yes, he is shouting it out. I am listening. I cannot repeat it. Horla. I have heard the Horla. It is he, the Horla. He has come. Ah, the vulture has eaten the pigeon. The wolf has eaten the lamb. The lion has devoured the buffalo with sharp horns. Man has killed the lion with an arrow, with a sword, with gunpowder. But the Horla will make of man what we have made of the horse and of the ox, his chattel, his slave, and his food, by the mere power of his will. Woe to us! But nevertheless, the animal sometimes revolts and kills the man who has subjugated it. I should also like, I shall be able to, but I must know him, touch him, see him. Learned men say that beasts' eyes, as they differ from ours, do not distinguish like ours do, and my eye cannot distinguish this newcomer who is oppressing me. Why? Oh, now I remember the words of the monk at Mont Saint Michel. Can we see the hundred thousandth part of what exists? Look here. There is the wind, which is the strongest force in nature, which knocks down men and blows down buildings, uproots trees, raises the sea into mountains of water, destroys cliffs, and casts great ships onto the breakers. The wind which kills, which whistles, which sighs, which roars. Have you ever seen it? And can you see it? It exists for all that, however. And I went on thinking. My eyes are so weak, so imperfect, that they do not even distinguish hard bodies if they are as transparent as glass. If a glass without tinfoil behind it were to bar my way, I should run into it, just as a bird which has flown into a room breaks its head against the window panes. A thousand things, moreover, deceive him and lead him astray. How should it then be surprising that he cannot perceive a fresh body which is traversed by the light? A new being? Why not? It was assuredly bound to come. Why should we be the last? We do not distinguish it like all the other created before us. The reason is that its nature is more perfect, its body finer and more finished than ours. That ours is so weak, so awkwardly conceived, encumbered with organs that are always tired, always on the strain like locks that are too complicated, which lives like a plant and like a beast, nourishing itself with difficulty on air, herbs, and flesh. An animal machine which is prey to maladies, to malformations, to decay broken-winded, badly regulated, simple and eccentric, ingeniously badly made. A coarse and a delicate work, the outline of a being which might become intelligent and grand. We are only a few, so few in this world, from the oyster up to man. Why should there not be one more, when once that period is accomplished which separates the successive apparitions from all the different species? Why not one more? Why not also other trees with immense splendid flowers perfuming whole regions? Why not other elements besides fire, air, earth, and water? There are four, only four, those nursing fathers of various beings. What a pity! Why are they not forty, four hundred, four thousand? How poor everything is, how mean and wretched, grudgingly given, dryly invented, clumsily made! Ah, the elephant and the hippopotamus, what grace, and the camel! What elegance! But the butterfly, you will say, a flying flower! I dream of one that should be as large as a hundred worlds, with wings whose shape, beauty, colors, and motion I cannot even express. But I see it! It flutters from star to star, refreshing them and perfuming them with the light and the harmonious breath of its flight. And the people up there look at it as it passes in an ecstasy of delight. What is the matter with me? It is he! the Horla who haunts me and who makes me think of these foolish things. He is within me. He is becoming my soul. I shall kill him. August 19th. I shall kill him. I have seen him. Yesterday I sat down at my table and pretended to write very assiduously. I knew quite well that he would come prowling round me, quite close to me, so close that I might perhaps be able to touch him, to seize him. And then, then I should have the strength of desperation. I should have my hands, my knees, my chest, my forehead, my teeth to strangle him, to crush him, to bite him, to tear him to pieces. And I watched for him with all my overexcited organs. I had lighted my two lamps and the eight wax candles on my mantelpiece, as if by this light I could have discovered him. My bed, my old oak bed with its columns, was opposite to me. On my right was the fireplace, on my left the door, which was carefully closed after I had left it open for some time in order to attract him. 
Behind me was a very high wardrobe, with a looking-glass in it, which served to make me my toilette every day, and in which I was in the habit of looking at myself from head to foot every time I passed it. So I pretended to be writing in order to deceive him, for he was also watching me, and suddenly I felt, I was certain, that he was reading over my shoulder, that he was there, almost touching my ear. I got up so quickly with my hands extended that I almost fell. Eh? Well. It was as bright as midday, but I did not see myself in the glass. It was empty, clear, profound, full of light, but my figure was not reflected in it. And I, I was opposite to it. I saw the large clear glass from top to bottom, and I looked at it with unsteady eyes, and I did not dare to advance. I did not venture to make a movement, nevertheless feeling perfectly that he was there, but that he would escape me again he whose imperceptible body had absorbed my reflection. How frightened I was! And then, suddenly, I began to see myself through a mist in the depths of the looking-glass, in a mist as if it were through a sheet of water. And it seemed to me as if this water were flowing slowly from left to right and making my figure clearer every moment. It was like the end of an eclipse. Whatever it was that hid me did not appear to possess any clearly defined outlines, but a sort of opaque transparency which gradually grew clearer. At last I was able to distinguish myself completely, as I do every day when I look at myself. I had seen it, and the horror of it remained with me and makes me shudder even now. August 20th. How could I kill it as I could not get hold of it? Poison? but it would see me mix it with the water, and then would our poison have any effect on its impalpable body? No, no, no doubt about the matter. Then, then? August 21st. I sent for a blacksmith from Rouen, and ordered iron shutters of him for my room, such as some private hotels in Paris have on the ground floor for fear of thieves, and he is going to make me a similar door as well. I have made myself out as a coward but I do not care about that. September 10th. Rouen Hotel Continental. It is done. It is done. But is he dead? My mind is thoroughly upset by what I have seen. Well, then, yesterday, the locksmith having put on the iron shutters and door, I left everything open until midnight, although it was getting cold. Suddenly I felt that he was there, and joy, mad joy, took possession of me. I got up softly, and I walked to the right and left for some time, so that he might not guess anything. Then I took off my boots and put on my slippers carelessly. Then I fastened the iron shutters, and going back to the door quickly, I double-locked it with a padlock, putting the key into my pocket. Suddenly I noticed that he was moving restlessly round me, that in his turn he was frightened and was ordering me to let him out. I nearly yielded, though I did not yet. But, putting my back to the door, I half opened it, just enough to allow me to go out backward, and as I am very tall, my head touched the lintel. I was sure that he had not been able to escape, and I shut him up quite alone, quite alone. What happiness! I had him fast. Then I ran downstairs in the drawing-room which was under my bedroom. I took the two lamps, and I poured all the oil onto the carpet, the furniture, everywhere. Then I set fire to it and made my escape, after having carefully double-locked the door. I went and hid myself at the bottom of the garden in a clump of laurel bushes. How long it was! How long it was! Everything was dark, silent, motionless. Not a breath of air and not a star, but heavy banks of clouds which one could not see, but which weighed, oh, so heavily on my soul. I looked at my house and waited. How long it was! I already began to think that the fire had gone out of its own accord, or that he had extinguished it when one of the lower windows gave way under the violence of the flames and a long, soft, caressing sheet of red flame mounted up the white wall and kissed it as high as the roof. The light fell onto the trees, the branches and the leaves, and a shiver of fear pervaded them also. The birds awoke, a dog began to howl, and it seemed to me as if the day were breaking. Almost immediately two other windows flew into fragments, and I saw that the whole of the lower part of my house was nothing but a terrible furnace. But a cry! A horrible, shrill, heart-rending cry, a woman's cry, sounded through the night, and two garret windows were opened. I had forgotten the servants. I saw the terror-struck faces and their frantically waving arms. Then, overwhelmed with horror, I set off to run to the village, shouting, Help! Help! Fire! Fire! I met some people who were already coming onto the scene, and I went back with them to see. 
By this time the house was nothing but a horrible and magnificent funeral pile, a monstrous funeral pile which lit up the whole country, a funeral pile where men were burning, and where he was burning also. He, he, my prisoner, that new being, the new master, the Horla. Suddenly the whole roof fell in between the walls, and a volcano of flames darted up to the sky. Through all the windows which opened onto that furnace I saw the flames darting, and I thought that he was there, in that kiln. Dead. Dead? Perhaps. His body? Was not his body which was transparent, indestructible by such means as would kill ours? If he was not dead, perhaps time alone has power over that invisible and redoubtable being. Why this transparent, unrecognizable body, this body belonging to a spirit, if it also had to fear ills, infirmities, and premature destruction? Premature destruction? All human terror springs from that. After man, the Horla, after him who can die every day, at any hour, at any moment, by any accident, he came who was only to die at his own proper hour and minute, because he had touched the limits of existence. No, no, without any doubt, he is not dead. Then, then, I suppose I must kill myself. End of the Horla by Guy de Maupassant